tempted Adam and Eve to sin against God. In a nutshell, he made them dissatisfied with what they had. And what they had was perfection. We're talking about how to be happy, and I tell you, one of the ways that Satan keeps us from being happy is we aren't satisfied with what we have. Stay tuned for the Gospel Truth. Welcome to Gospel Truth with Andrew Womack, a teaching ministry emphasizing God's unconditional love and grace. And now, here's Andrew. Welcome to our Monday's broadcast of the Gospel Truth. This week I'm continuing a series that I started last week talking about how to be happy. And I tell you, I'm excited about this. Every time I minister on this, it helps me. Uh, you know, it's just like the world is trying to press in on us constantly and you have to, you have to build yourself up. You have to do things to encourage yourself. There's a scripture over in 1 Samuel chapter 30 around verses 4 through 6 where David had been going through this hardship for a number of years. Most people believe it was a minimum of 10 years to 13 years after he had been anointed to be king. And yet everything had been hardship on him. He had been chased by Saul, his father-in-law, and the previous king had tried to kill him, had taken his wife away, given her to other people, and he was just struggling, struggling, struggling. And he came back one time, and the Amalekites, this group of people, had inter, uh, invaded his territory, had burnt his city, had taken not only his wives and children, but all of the men that were with him, their entire families. And it was such a bad situation. They had suffered for so long that now David's own men were about to stone him to death. And it says in the midst of this that David wept, lift up his voice and wept until he had no more power to weep. And then his old man started to stone him. But it says in the midst of that, but David encouraged himself in the Lord his God. What a powerful, powerful truth. And again, uh, one of the points I was trying to get across last week is that most people say, well, yeah, I want to be happy. Nobody wants to be unhappy but they don't assume any responsibility for this. They think that happiness is just a byproduct of having everything in your life go right. And last week I was trying to disprove that and show examples of people who rejoiced before their deliverance came and showing how that we were commanded to rejoice and be of good cheer even when there's tribulation in the world. And I was showing that we can rejoice and stir ourselves up, or just as David did, encourage ourselves in the Lord. When everything around you is bad, when you've lost your family, when your wife and children have been taken, you're devastated, your own men are going to turn on you and kill you. In the midst of that situation, you need to encourage yourself in the Lord your God. And because David did that, did you know that within 20 Four hours, the thing that he had been believing for for years came to pass. He was on the threshold of victory, and yet if he would have let sadness and depression and hardship come in and dominate him, he would have missed out on God's will. He would have allowed his own man to stone him to death, and he would have been less than 24 hours away from the thing that he had been believing for for over a decade. It's the same with all of us. We need to rejoice. We need to be happy. And so that's the point that I was making last week. And I tell you, that point needs to be made over and over and over and over again because the world is just constantly coming in us with all this negative stuff. And even advertising is trying to make us unhappy with what we've got and make us think that we've got to have something more before we can be happy. So we are inundated with all of these terrible tragedies and bad news that if you just focus on that, you are going to be depressed and discouraged. All advertisement, which, boy, we are inundated with advertisement, it's all trying to make you unhappy with what you've got and tell you you've got to have more to be happy. Our whole world system is just, you know, pressing in on us. You know, I remember one time when I was in Vietnam, and it's normally hot in Vietnam, but I was up in the mountains of Vietnam. They didn't issue us uh, field jackets because of that. But there was a monsoon season, and during that time, it got down. I mean, you could blow smoke and see smoke, you know, with your, with your breath. It got cold enough that I was cold, and I didn't have um, any field jacket or anything, and I was on bunker guard. Man, I was cold. You know, I've said that I've never taken a drink 
of coffee in my whole life. Some of you have heard me tell about that. But on this bunker guard, I was so cold that they came around with hot coffee, and what I did was put the coffee between my legs, and I warmed my hands, let the steam warm my hands, and then as soon as it quit steaming, I poured it over my hands to help thaw them out. That's about the closest to drinking coffee I've ever been. And I remember during that period of time, I was so cold. And uh, finally, they came around and gave me a blanket. And man, when I put that blanket around me, it was just, it was one of the greatest feelings to be just, si I was shivering, I was so cold. I put that blanket around me, that felt so good. And I remember at that time praying and thinking, you know, the scripture that says, because iniquity shall abound, the love of many will wax cold. And I was making a comparison between what I just felt physically and what I was seeing spiritually there. And I was saying, God, you know, I know that this world is an ungodly place that most people don't love you and they aren't seeking you. And I said, God, you know, just like this blanket is insulating me right now and keeping me warm, I'm praying that you would somehow or another keep the unbelief and the, the uh, ungodliness of this world from ever creeping on the inside of me to where I lose my love and my desire for you. You know, that really ministered to me. I still remember that today, but that really is descriptive of the way our world is. Our world, in case you hadn't noticed, isn't positive. They aren't happy. They're miserable. You'll have people that present it, but it's just, for anybody who understands what true happiness is and true joy in the Lord, the stuff that the world is talking about is silly, it's foolish, it's temporary, it is completely dependent upon circumstances. What the world is calling joy isn't joy at all. It's revelry, it's lust, it's ungodliness. But man, there is a true joy in the Lord that you need. And uh, the good news is that you can have it. So that's what we've been talking about. Let me turn over to a passage of Scripture and start sharing this with you. The very first temptation that came on the earth, of course, was when Satan came against Adam and Eve and tempted them. This is recorded in Genesis chapter 3. And I want to show you from this passage of Scripture something that you may not have seen before. But actually, Adam and Eve's temptation started with them becoming dissatisfied with what they had. They quit appreciating what they had. And what they had was perfection. It was infinitely greater than what any of us have now. We, had, we live in a corrupted world. They lived in an uncorrupted world, a perfect world. Everything was good. And yet Satan got them dissatisfied with perfection. That was a part of their temptation. And then when they ate of the fruit on the tree, that was just the way they acted it out. But did you know they sinned before that? If I had time, I've got a series, I taught this not too long ago, entitled The Positive Ministry of the Holy Spirit, and it will show you that, you know, sin isn't just the things you do. It, sin has to be conceived. Sin actually starts in seed form in your heart. And long before Adam and Eve ate of the fruit that God had forbidden them to eat of, they had already sinned in their heart because they quit believing in the goodness of God they became dissatisfied with all the wonderful things that God had given them. They bought into this lie that they had to do something more. They had to have this fruit before they could really be complete. They became dissatisfied with perfection. I don't know if you understand what I'm saying here, but that is a wonderful, powerful truth that has direct application to every one of us. If we become dissatisfied, if we aren't appreciating and enjoying the things that God has given us and instead we are thinking, I can't be complete until I have this, a new mate, a new house, a new car, a better job, until I get this. If you are living a life like that, you are just open prey to the devil. That's how he got Adam and Eve into their sin. That's awesome. You know, I'll tell you what, I'm going to really share that on the other side of this break. But before I get into these scriptures in Genesis 3, let me just ask you this question. And this is something you need to think about. If you can understand what I'm saying here, this will make a big difference in your life. But just imagine for a moment <clears throat> that you were Satan. Some of you are going to have a harder time imagining this than others. Amen. <laughs> Some of you might be able to readily identify with this and just immediately 
fit into this slot. But just imagine that you were Satan and you wanted to come against Adam and Eve and tempt them to rebel at God. How would you tempt a perfect person? Now think about this. Because see, if you were to come to me or something, you could tempt me with money. And you could say, man, I'll give you enough money that you'll never have to worry about anything again. You couldn't tempt Adam and Eve with money. They didn't have money. There was nothing to buy. Everything in the whole world was theirs. It all belonged to them. God gave them everything. So there was no need for money. There was no need for power. There was no need for fame. Everybody in the world knew them. <laughs> there was only two people. And so the fame, money, power, sexual things, you couldn't tempt them with sex because there was nobody else to go have adultery with. It was only Adam and Eve. And there was nothing that was forbidden unto them. You couldn't tempt them with any of the things that we use and normally think of that corrupt people. So if you were Satan and you came to people who you couldn't tempt them with lust, you couldn't tempt them with sexual perversion, you couldn't tempt them with money, you couldn't tempt them with fame, with power, you couldn't have them do something out of bitterness and anger because they had never been mistreated, they had never been abused. How do you tempt perfect people? That's quite a quandary. And you know how he did it? He basically convinced them they didn't have enough. They needed more. These were people who were perfect, had everything. Most of us would give up all of the houses, the cars, everything we've got to be back in that state that Adam and Eve were in. And yet a talking snake convinced people who were living in perfection that it wasn't good enough. They had to have something more. If you can do that to people who are living in perfection, then don't you think that Satan is probably using the same ploy on us who now live in imperfection with all kinds of lacks and problems? Well, that's powerful. We're going to take a break here, and on the other side of the break, I'm going to come back and I'm going to finish this story about Adam and Eve. But listen as our announcer gives you this information, and then I'll be right back. Andrew's complete teaching titled, How to Be Happy, is available in a six-part album on tape or CD. It's also available in a DVD album recorded from television. Request album T1019 when you send a gift of 19 pounds or more to Andrew Womack Ministries of Europe. Be sure to specify tape, CD, or DVD album when you write or call. The second teaching in this album is also available on tape or CD. We suggest a donation of three pounds. But for those unable to give, Andrew and his partners will provide this second teaching free of charge. Make your check payable to AWME. That's Andrew Womack Ministries of Europe, P.O. Box 4392, Walsall, WS1, 9AR, England. Our telephone number is 01922 473 300. Or you can go to our website at any hour. You can use credit card to make donations and receive ministry products 24 hours a day at www.awme.net. Thank you for your gift today. And now, Gospel Truth continues. So how could Satan tempt perfect people who had no needs, had never been abused, had never had any problem. God had been wonderful to them. He met with them, talked with them in the cool of the evening. They lived in a perfect world. The climate was just right. They didn't have clothes to believe for. They didn't have to have a house. They didn't have to have a car. There was nothing. Everything was perfect. How do you tempt people who are living in perfection to sin against the one who created and endowed them with all of this perfection? You know how Satan did it? He got them to thinking that they didn't have enough, that they had to have something more before they could be happy. Boy, does that have direct application to us or what? Look at this in Genesis chapter 3, verse 1. It says, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. You know, I've got six hours worth of teaching on, on these six verses. I can't go through all this, but let me just point out some things as we go along. The devil didn't choose the strongest, the biggest animal, such as a mammoth or an elephant, to come and try and intimidate them. He didn't take some ferocious animal like a lion to come and tell them, if you don't eat of this tree, I'm going to kill you. He chose the most subtle animal because Satan had no power 
to force Adam and Eve into doing anything. He couldn't make them sin against God. He had to deceive them into this. Satan's only power was deception. So it is with us. Satan can't force you to be discouraged. He can't force you into rebellion. He can't force you into sin. He has to deceive you. He can't do anything to you without your consent and cooperation. Boy, is that a powerful truth. Thank you, Jesus. And then he said, Hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. Here he is attacking the Word of God, saying, Do you really believe the Word of God? Yes, I really believe the Word of God. And you know what? For you to get into any type of deception or sin, you have to move away from the Word of God, either because of ignorance, because you don't know what it says, or if you know what it says, then you have to quit believing it. And I tell you, the Word of God is being attacked. We've got people with evolution trying to say that the Word of God isn't accurate. We've got science that disproves the Bible. There is nothing in science that has disproved the Bible. You've got some theories of men that don't square with the Bible, but the theories of men are wrong. The Word of God is accurate. And there's entire groups of scientists, thousands of scientists, who have subscribed to an intelligent design theory of creation because the facts don't support evolution. I have people that will write in to me. I had a person not long ago that was a partner of ours, and they said some nice things that I've been a blessing, but when I get out of the Bible and start talking about science, that I'm just crazy, that evolution has been proven, there is no doubt about it. That's not true. There are thousands and thousands of scientists that are coming against evolution because it can happen. It is physically impossible. There is nothing that you can't observe it. Anyway, I'm not going to spend my whole program on evolution, but I'm saying that today Satan is doing the exact same thing that he did back then. He's attacking the Word of God. If we would believe the account that you were created by God, that you didn't evolve out of some slime someplace, but that a creator made you and has a design and a purpose for your life, if you believe that, you know what? You would change your life. You aren't like a dog. You aren't an animal that can live any way you want to and you just die and are gone. You were created by God and someday after you die in this physical life, you are going to go back to a creator. You're going to stand before him and have to give an answer for the things done in your life. If you really believe that, it would influence the way you live right now. But there's a lot of people that are buying into evolution, not because it's accurate, not because it's true or proven, but it's because they want, it's what they want to believe. Satan attacked the Word of God and says, Has God said this? And so the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch, touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. Just an out-and-out -out lie. They did die. It's just exactly what God said came to pass. And regardless of whether you believe it or not, what God says in His Word is true, and it is going to come to pass. And you don't have to believe it. You can be wrong if you want to, but I'm not going to agree with you, or we'd both be wrong. I'm telling you, the Word of God is the truth. And so the serpent said unto the woman, You shall not surely die, for God doth know that in the day you eat thereof, then your eyes shall be open, and you shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. In other words, he was saying, You know what? God's holding something back from you. There is something that you aren't experiencing. The truth is they were experiencing everything that was good. It is true that God had held evil back from them. They didn't know evil. They didn't understand hatred, strife, sickness, disease, lying. They didn't understand any of these kind of things. It is true that there was things they were missing out on, but there was nothing they were missing out on that was any good. And you know what? The Lord had withheld only evil from them. He hadn't withheld anything good. But Satan convinced them that they weren't really like God, that they were b below the standards. And here's something that is kind of subtle. Some people miss this, but I want you to think about this. This is really important. Let's just suppose that there were a thousand fruit-bearing trees in the garden. I don't know how many fruit-bearing trees there are now, but what, however many there are, they all were there in the garden. Every fruit-bearing tree, every tree, every uh, shrub, herb, bush that you could get berries from, anything like that was all in the Garden of Eden. And let's just suppose that there were a thousand. If Satan would have come to them and would have said, 
Has God said that you can only eat of 999 out of the thousand trees? You know, if he would have phrased his temptation that way, just the very phrasing of it would have been an encouragement to them to totally reject what he's got to say because here's the logic. That you know what, if, if there was a thousand fruit-bearing trees or bushes, shrubs, in the garden. And if God gave them access to 999 and only told them not to eat of one, then the very mention of those 999 would have been such a statement about the goodness and the kindness of God to have given them all of this that they could have looked at it and thought, you know, who cares about the one? Look at these 999. Look at all of the good things that God has given us. If they would have eaten of one fruit one day, did you know it would have taken nearly three years for them to make the rounds and go to all this? They would have never had to have repeated a single fruit. And that's just supposing that there was a thousand uh, trees that they could eat from in the garden. There's probably more than that. You know, if you just stop and think about it, man, God was so good, He gave them all of this. Who cares about this one? It's insignificant compared to all of these others that God had given them. But see, that's not the approach that Satan took. He didn't say, has God only given you 999 fruit-bearing trees to eat from? No, he didn't talk about any of the good. He didn't mention, he didn't reference, he didn't even acknowledge that there was anything good in creation that God had done. He focused on the one thing in the universe, one thing. Did you know God didn't put down restrictions? He didn't tell them they couldn't go out of the garden. He didn't tell them anything. The only restriction God gave mankind in this entire earth, two people on the face of the earth in a perfect paradise, perfect situation, perfect climate, everything was wonderful, God said one thing. And Satan focused on the one thing that God told them not to do and magnified that to where it was bigger than all of the good things that God had done for them. And that is the way of the devil. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11, I believe it is, Paul said, I fear lest as Satan beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your minds should be corrupted through the simplicity that's in Christ. Satan is trying to tempt us exactly the way he did Adam and Eve. And instead of having us focus on all of the good things that are going in our life, what he does is try and get us to focus on what we don't have. He tries to make us dissatisfied with what we don't have. We don't accept all of the good things that are going on. Instead, we focus on the negative things. You know, as I was driving in today, I was thinking, of course, about teaching on this and ministering on this. And, you know, I live in a beautiful place. God has blessed me. Man, I'm up on a mountaintop. I went out, and there was about a dozen deer out there. They will eat out of my hands. And you know what? I do this so often. I, I have all of these animals. I had a bear last year try and get in the, in the uh, spa with me while I was in there. And, of course, that's a little too close. I had to get up and scare him off. But I have bear and deer and elk and fox and raccoons and all of these things. I just love being out in the woods, and it's awesome. But you know what? I, you get to where you tend to start taking some of those things for granted. And today, as I was out feeding the deer before I left, 6 o'clock in the morning, you know, I had about a dozen deer all around me. And I was just thinking, boy, about what a blessing that is. But you know what? You have to force yourself to think on this. As I drove in, I saw all of these deer. I remember that as I was driving down our driveway, we've had a lot of snow and, and rain and things, and man, the creek is running. Things are turning green. We've got all of these bushes that are budding out. The trees are beginning to bud. Did you know that you may be seeing this on a time delay? You may, it may be after spring in your area, but every one of you went through spring, and yet many of us missed the blessing of it. What a great thing to be able to see this. That's something that we could be praising God about. It ought to just make you rejoice. As I was driving in, I was up above the clouds. We had clouds, and I was looking up. A, the sun was shining, and I was looking down on that. Like, it's like a carpet or something underneath you. It was beautiful. And, you know, as I was driving in, I was just, it seemed like I was aware of all of these things, just praising God. The truth is God is good to every one of us. 
Man, you've got nature all around you. You've got good things going on. Yes, you may have problems, but you've got a lot to be rejoicing for, too. And I tell you, there's some great truths in this. I'm out of time today. I'm going to have to continue it on my program tomorrow. But I encourage you to listen in then. And also, listen as our announcer gives you some information about how you can receive this teaching on how to be happy, especially if you are a Christian. Andrew's complete teaching titled, How to Be Happy, is available in a six-part album on tape or CD. It's also available in a DVD album recorded from television. Request album T1019 when you send a gift of 19 pounds or more to Andrew Womack Ministries of Europe. Be sure to specify tape, CD, or DVD album when you write or call. The second teaching in this album is also available on tape or CD. We suggest a donation of three pounds. But for those unable to give, Andrew and his partners will provide this second teaching free of charge. On today's program, Andrew mentioned his teaching titled, The Positive Ministry of the Holy Spirit. We want you to know that this product is available in a four-part album on tape or CD for a donation of 13 pounds or more. Request product number T1020. Make your check payable to AWME. That's Andrew Womack Ministries of Europe, P.O. Box 4392, Walsall, WS1, 9AR, England. Our telephone number is 01922-473-300. Or you can go to our website at any hour. You can use credit card to make donations and receive ministry products 24 hours a day at www.awme.net. Thank you for your gift today. I've always got more to share with you than what I have time to share, and so I would like to point you towards our website. I think it is a tremendous, tremendous place for you to get ministry. Everywhere I go, people come up and tell me it's one of the best websites that they have ever seen. I've got about seven years worth of my television archived on there, about eight to ten years worth of radio. We've got books on there. I've got all of my sermons, over 300 sermons that are free that you can listen to, download to your MP3. I've got part of my Bible commentary that you can download absolutely free. It's a great website, so check us out at awme.net. A healing journey is the walk of faith we all must take in order to manifest the healing God has provided in Jesus Christ. Damon and Renee Peterson took that walk for more than a year after their son Jason developed a severe skin problem. One day as Damon was praying in tongues and watching his son play, God spoke to him, instructing him to pray for his son's heart. Within one week, all the skin symptoms disappeared. And we were just like, we have a new kid. It was amazing. And he was happy. Be sure to watch Gospel Truth in the weeks ahead as we bring you this inspiring story. Be sure to tune in tomorrow for more Gospel Truth. And without dissatisfaction, I don't believe you would ever submit to, to uh, temptation. If Satan hadn't been able to get Adam and Eve to become dissatisfied with paradise, with perfection. He could never have gotten them to take that step to disobey God. And the way he did it was by focusing on the one thing they didn't have. Brothers and sisters, let me just be honest with you. There's always going to be something in your life that could be better. There's always something that you could have more.